Well, greetings and welcome. Nice to have you here. Jonathan Faust here, and I will be guiding the following meditation and this talk, which is on mindfulness in daily life. What does that look like? It's going to be fun, I think. I've had fun putting this talk together. So before we launch, thank yous. First of all, thank you and an acknowledgement to our mindful movement leader, Dorita Moran, and to our mindful dialogue facilitator, Ray Maniocchi. If you would like the whole Monday night experience we've laid out for you, at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, you can join Rita for Mindful Movement. That'll get you all settled down and prepped for this. And then afterward, you can join Ray for Mindful Dialogue, which is an opportunity to share about the talk, about your practice, what's going on in your life, facilitated beautifully by Ray. That's 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, and then this is 7.30, and then afterward, around 8.35 or something like that, you can join Ray. So those links are on my Facebook page and on my site. Please feel free. Also, a big thank you to Glenn Harrison, our producer who makes this possible through the magic of technology, and to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting and for all they do. As well, I'd like to let you know that um, this is all offered freely. Um, offered with a lot of joy, offered with um, a lot of um, appreciation. And it's all also offered kind of under the kind of the guidelines of, of generosity itself. That is to say that these practices and teachings are considered priceless, so they should not be offered for a price. So if you feel inspired to help make this accessible to everyone who's interested, I really appreciate your, your help. So thank you for that. Let's see. I also have a newsletter, a weekly, which tells you about what's coming up, and then the monthly, which uh, has my photography for the month and little update and compendium of talks, that sort of thing. And um, I do have a big thing coming up. January 21st, a day-long retreat, the most important thing, starting your year with mindful intention. It's an opportunity uh, to reflect on this last year, what went well, what didn't go well, what did you say you were going to do, what didn't you do, and then to really kind of divine and sense what calls you now, where's the aliveness now. It's a great retreat. I've offered this every year for the last many years, and uh, I look forward to another one. So if you can feel free to join in if you like. I think that's it. So uh, without further ado, let's take a little time. Um, to practice some mindfulness. And you might begin by closing your eyes and take a moment just to sense how does your body need to move right now to kind of prepare yourself for, for sitting still. Feel free to stretch. Feel free to reach up. Let out any sounds. Open your jaw wide. See if you can invoke the yawn reflex. <coughs> And then as you're ready, let yourself just settle into a quiet space of inner focus. And you might just sense right now, where do you feel the breath the most predominant? As our topic for tonight is on mindfulness, let's just reflect on what mindfulness is. A couple definitions. Mindfulness is non-judging attention. Just sense that quality of what does it mean to observe without judgment? Paying attention on purpose. That is to say, to explore what does it mean to be here and now? One way to facilitate this sense of here and now is to relax and soften. And you might just in these moments just notice the sounds around you and notice if you can relax this sense of, of listening and actively receiving the sound vibrations 360 degrees. <clears throat> I 
noticing the air touching the skin, can you receive the sensations against the skin? And exploring this sense of not trying to make anything happen, but to be aware of what's already here. A few key areas where you might consciously soften and feel. The first is to feel your forehead smooth. And then to explore all the muscles of your face and to allow your face to become expressionless. All little micro muscles relaxing. And feel now the inside of the mouth. Can you relax and feel the, the volume of your lips? <clears throat> Can you let your tongue relax and feel your lower jaw? And you might explore now as you sense the belly. Over the next three exhalations, how much more can you soften the belly down deep in the abdomen? And can you sense from the inside the, the volume of your hands, the space inside your hands? Is there any sense of pulse or tingling or vibration you can feel here? Sensing from the inside the soles of the feet and the heels. And can you feel from the inside any sense of aliveness here? Again, tingling, vibration, sensation. And as you sense from the inside, this, this whole space inside your body, is there anything right now that could relax or soften or let go? And if you bring your attention now, Again, to the sounds around you. You might notice how the sounds are constantly changing. And can you sense who you are as the one who is aware of this change in sound vibration? <clears throat> And if you bring your attention to where you feel the breath the most predominant right now. Over the next breath or two, can you track the, the changing sensations inside in regard to the experience of the breath? And 
and selecting one of these anchors, sound or breath, or if there's another anchor you'd like to explore, please feel free. For this next period of time, let this be your primary doorway back to the sense of here and now. Again and again, returning back to the experience of breath or sound. From time to time, you might explore the following questions. What could relax or soften right now? How intimately can you feel this point of contact with your anchor right now? Can you sense this quality of the witness or the observer right now? And as you notice what is present and notice what is changing, can you let it be just as it is? Relax and at the same time alert and awake and allowing. You might sense in these remaining minutes this quality of foreground and background and the foreground awareness of your anchor of sound or breath in the background this heightened perception of this field of change a stream of phenomena passing through and the sense of holding this in non-judging awake awareness What could relax or soften or let go right now? Letting all technique fall away, just relax and feel, noting the quality of presence and letting this be. And then as you're ready, let your body move and stretch in any way that feels good, moving into your transition. There's no hurry. <clears throat> Welcome back. There's a well-known talk by an 
Admiral, uh, William McCraven, who gave a commencement speech at his alma mater. You may have heard this. At, uh, at that time, he'd been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, and he made this statement. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. He goes on to say this. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. By the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you will never do the big things right. This talk made a lot of waves and um, <clears throat> kind of inspired me. But then, of course, this is the age of the Internet, so uh, getting another point of view is just one click away. <laughs> so here is the alternative. When you sleep, you lose one liter of fluids per night. If you make your bed right away, your bed needs to dry out so uh, you're not um, cultivating microbes. If you don't make it wake wake if you don't make your bed in the morning you wake up knowing you have one less task to do. If you don't make your bed in the morning you save 5 minutes every single day. That's like 30 hours a year or something like that. 2000 hours of the course of your lifetime is yours because you didn't make your bed. And there's also a link to embracing disorganization and your capacity for creativity. So not making your bed might make you a more creative person. <laughs> so the bottom line of this is the only person who can decide what is mindful is you. And that's kind of what I'd like to talk about. A big thank you to Mike who suggested I talk about what mindfulness in daily life looks like. And he offered me this quote from Utejaniya. Sayadaw Utejaniya says, to be mindful from the time you wake up in the morning until you go to bed at night. That's the task. Be mindful from when you wake up to when you go to bed. Well, okay. So I thought I'd share a little bit with you about what works for me, uh, how, at many, how at times I fail miserably at being mindful. And, and keep in mind that what works for me may be the opposite of what works for you. <clears throat> so what I'd like to talk about, mindfulness in daily life. First of all, setting the stage, kind of like morning routines, a little bit on some of the fundamentals of mindfulness, and applying mindfulness through, through your day and in your relationships, applying mindfulness to the challenges that show up. And then a little bit on the end of the day. How can you be more mindful at the end of the day? So this is going to be a little scattershot, but it's been fun to put together. I hope you find it helpful. So I thought I'd start with the morning. How do I begin a day um, being mindful? So after Tara and I do our morning prayers, I juice the, the fresh kale for our morning kale and spirulina enemas. No, I don't. <laughs> Before I tell you my morning routine, what's your morning routine? And can you just take a moment, close your eyes, or just reflect for a moment? <clears throat> when you think of of your your morning routine, your more your morning routine, your morning ablutions, is there a sense of what what works for you? And what doesn't? Is there a sense of what you could refine to help you get? the best, most meaningful, mindful start to your day. So let me share with you, first of all, um, my bad habits. I have a really bad habit of, when I wake up, opening my phone. Part of it is to sort of check my sleep app, but also to check the weather, because I often will want to go out. And what I've noted is, 
once I check the weather and then I check my sleep app, I usually take a glance at my messages and my email to see if there are any catastrophes I need to deal with. And I've noted that if I get caught there, I get sucked into a rabbit hole and that affects my morning. I would love to train myself to not check my phone. I have at times. Don't check my phone until after meditation. And I know some people who do that really, really well. For me, it sort of like calms my anxiety a little bit just to make sure the world is still out there. Oftentimes, I've, I've told this story many times, I, I wake up and my first thought is, you know, I should do some yoga, which is followed by the thought, I hate yoga. And I've noticed that when I do yoga, I think, God, I love yoga. I should do this every day. And I repeat that every morning. To kind of break that pattern, I realized, well, how much yoga? And I realized many, many years ago, seven minutes of yoga I could commit to. And seven minutes actually does feel good. It's not, I don't feel over obligated, but I do have a little morning routine I do just to kind of get, get things flowing for me. Uh, I do one round of like a sun salutation in the morning with some variations. And that actually gets my body moving and helps me to kind of get some tensions out of the way that might build up if I didn't address them right away. I also take on some fluids right away. And then the last six months, I use something called athletic greens uh, just to get probiotics and good stuff in my body. I've also noticed for myself, as I've explored, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, part of starting the day is about refraining from, as best I can, from getting sucked into the internet, but also holding back on caffeine. I noticed the pattern I got into of just loving my coffee, having it early in the morning, but then having a slump. And I realized later that what's really, really helpful is to hold back on caffeine for at least 90 minutes. There's a adenosine that needs to clear out of your system. So I, I kind of push the coffee back and that becomes a treat after I've done my, my morning disciplines. Then the question often is, do I, do I sit in meditation or do I, do I do some movement? I have often find for myself, and again, it's all experimentation that what works for me or what's or what I really enjoy and find helpful is to to sit before my mind gets stirred up so quite often I'll just quietly get up and go to another room kind of bundle up and I'll do my sit right away and it's almost as if I can sit without my mind being too disturbed but sometimes just based on time and when I get up and the weather and so forth, I love moving right into exercise. And I'm really lucky to have access to, um, to nature, to, to paddling. I'm lucky, lucky, lucky to have access to a pool. So oftentimes I will go right into exercise and that's a beautiful thing too. And sometimes I find Starting off with a calming meditation is great. Sometimes release the deep-seated tensions through exercise and meditation can be pretty blissful. So that's a kind of a practice of inner listening. Now, if I do go outside because of my mania around photography, uh, I have a lot of technology I have to organize. And if I go out paddling, I have a lot of stuff. So here, I try to practice as mindfully as I can Kind of that phrase, which I've, I've talked about before, of slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And I've noticed that if I'm haphazardly throwing stuff together, it kind of builds this kind of chaotic quality. So whatever routine I do in the morning, I try to do it slow and smooth because it's always the most efficient way to do it. So my camera gear, I've got four cameras, a tripod, lenses, batteries mm -hmm. topped off, check the settings on the cameras. And if I'm paddling again, I've got lots of gear, especially in the winter, um, kit with extra supplies. So that's all part of the beginning of my beginning of my 
my day. And a question I'll keep coming back to is when you look at structuring your day, cultivating mindfulness, what's your optimal window for focus and accomplishment? And we'll keep coming back to that. And for me, it's morning. So when I dedicate that early, early part of the day to, to movement, to meditation, to kind of gathering, then that sort of sets me up for how do I cultivate the most optimal space I can for like three or four hours where I'm focused and awake and aware. Mindful eating is a big part of it for me. So part of that is my coffee intake, my caffeine intake. I, I love coffee. I love everything about it. The smell, the mood enhancing elements. Um, also experimenting. Where's the middle way for caffeine for me? Too much, my mind turns into a paranoid chipmunk. Um, not enough, I go into kind of a detox. So one cup usually I found works for me and I, because I love it so much, I have a whole ritual. I have a hand grinder, I use an AeroPress, I have a, a little Nespresso foamer for uh, <laughs> for my, uh, my, uh, plant milk. And in the past, I used to really load up on a heavy protein breakfast. Uh, back when I when I ate eggs, when I was a, a vegan, I'd have like four eggs and oatmeal. And I was convinced this is what I needed to get a good start to the day or I'd die. And then I experimented and shift things around. And what I found, what really works for me over the last maybe five or six years is I don't have any solid food till much later in the day, so I make a drink. Um, I use a plant-based protein powder called Huel, uh, ground flaxseed, chia seeds, spirulina, and plant milk. I have that pre-made, I mix that up. And then I'm ready for my day. I have my caffeine, I have my drink, and then I can get, I can get focused. I do some journaling daily. I have a commitment to do that. Um, you know, lots of studies on journaling, you know, have suggested it's powerful for cultivating more self-awareness and uh, for more well-being. I used to set a goal of like so many words per day, and now I'm more focused on the minimum of effective dose. Just write something. And sometimes I'm into a flow, sometimes it's as minimal as I can make it, but I've kind of fulfilled that commitment. If you're interested in a journaling app, I highly recommend uh, a journal called Day One. It's Mac-based, it's cross-platform. Um, gosh, I have maybe like eight years where I try to do a daily entry. Um, it's got a lot of really cool features. So I've spent a fair bit of time trying to organize my life around when I'm optimally creative. And for me, for me, that's early morning. And setting the stage has been really, really helpful. Making the bed does make a difference for me. Organizing my office, having a clear desk are all kind of all part of my morning ritual. But let me take a few minutes to talk about what, what mindfulness in daily life means, just in general. There's a story of one of the supporters of the Buddha back in the Buddhist day. Was He was with the Buddha, kind of overlooking um, this little collective of practitioners. And, and this man said, why is everyone in your community so happy? And the Buddha said, well, we're aware of, of the body when we walk and when we eat and when we're cleaning up. And the donor said, well, but everyone walks and everyone eats and everyone's cleaning up after themselves. Well, what's the difference? And the Buddha said, yes, but how many people are really aware of walking when they're walking, eating when they're eating, cleaning up when they're cleaning up? And to me, that points toward this whole idea of paying attention on purpose and exploring the sense of non-judging awareness. So what does paying attention on purpose mean? What, what, what is it we're actually paying attention to? 
And here in our practice, it's about present moment awareness. It's about, about here and now. So this, again, is a practice that is so absurdly simple. And if you like, we'll just take a few moments just to touch in. If you like, you can close your eyes. Notice where you feel the breath the most predominant right now. I love this instruction from Thich Nhat Hanh. The simply noting. As I breathe in, I'm aware of breathing in. As I breathe out, I'm aware of breathing out. And if you would, for the next three breaths, let this be your practice. And now just release this practice and just notice, did anything shift over these last three breaths? What is it about this practice of paying attention on purpose? Of bringing attention to the direct experience of here and now. And you may have felt a sense of calming, a sense of gathering. And this is profound. Because when you are in the here and now, you're not only more aware of what's happening as it's happening, but you're also more aware of your relationship to what's happening. And this is the difference between reacting to your life and responding to your life. So simple, so not easy to practice. The core of this practice of mindfulness, the doorway is mindfulness of the body. I've told this story many times, but I, one of my favorite stories is the story of this radiant, radiant teacher. People would come from all over just to sit in her presence and share in that radiance. She was asked once, what is the key? What is the key to being so radiant, having so much light around you? And she said, I eat when I'm hungry and I sleep when I'm tired. Is it that simple? I once told that story and the punchline was I sleep when I'm hungry and I eat when I'm tired. And that's actually true. <laughs> Mostly I eat when I'm tired. I'll talk about that in a moment. When you are aware, deeply, deeply tuned in to your experience in the body, you're more aware of these very, very deep rhythms and the guidance of the body and the awakening of this sense of the witness of the observer. So we have these foundations of awareness, noticing the experience in the body, the direct here and now, right now, the sound vibrations around you. Right now, the sense of the breath. Next is mindfulness of feeling and feeling the feeling tone that arises from this direct experience of your body are sensations that are pleasant, sensations that are neutral and sensations that are unpleasant. This, this is one layer or level of awareness and you here you might just take a moment if you like, just close your eyes. Can you identify right now anything that feels unpleasant? tight or congested or heavy or stuck. Can you identify anything right now that feels pleasant, free flowing, easy, relaxed, open? And you can you sense that kind of ephemeral space in between, neither pleasant nor unpleasant, kind of neutral. What arises out of this realm of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral is our reactivity. 
It's mindfulness of thoughts, mindfulness of the emotions related to those thoughts. And the fourth is mindfulness of what we call the Dharma, or the mindfulness of truth, mindfulness of patterns. And here you begin to recognize there the, the five states that make it impossible to be present. You begin to recognize the seven faculties of, of being more awake. You begin to recognize the, the four underpinnings of truth around practice. All of this comes from mindfulness of the here and now. In the body, feeling tone, thoughts, emotions, and the recognition of these broader, vaster patterns. This simple practice leads us to a greater sense of freedom. And we can apply this to the challenges that arise in our lives. So as I reflect on bringing mindfulness into my day, it's been very, very helpful for me, and I think helpful for everyone to reflect on your chronotype. And your, your chronotype refers to when your system, when your body naturally wants to go to bed, and when your body naturally wants to wake up. If you think about being on a deserted island under no stress, when would you go to bed, when would you wake up? For me, I'm like in this 10% where my body wants to go to bed around 8.30. And if I sleep well, it wants to wake up about 4.30. So for me, my window of creativity and getting stuff done is from around 5 a.m. to around 1 p.m. After that, CPO starts slowing down and it kind of shuts off. And the important thing is that when you figure out, are you, a, are you a morning lark? Are you a night owl? Are you something in between? One is not better than another, but it's so important to find out what yours is and then, and then work your life around it. So this sacred time in the morning, when I'm most productive is, it's sacred to me. And the number one thing that gets in the way of being mindful and creative and, and in a flow state are distractions. I don't do social media. I, I don't check Facebook other than comments on my talks. I don't do Instagram. I don't do X. I, I'm not a gamer. I, I barely watch TV, but I will get sucked down two rabbit holes. One of them is called YouTube. And the other one is called Reddit. I'm the perfect candidate for the algorithm for YouTube shorts. If you get sucked into these, kind of the design is like every five or six, there's something stimulating, something that has you sit up a little bit and keeps you scrolling. And I can almost hear that little ping in my nervous system when I get that endorphin rush of a, of a laugh or a pleasant memory or something interesting. And sometimes I'm aware my mind is being manipulated, but it's still hard to stop. And if you're not familiar with Reddit, this is a program or a platform where there's an opinion or a reference there for just about anything you could possibly want to know. I do a lot of <clears throat> long distance outdoor swimming, my, one of my favorite things in my cheap 20-year-old wetsuits falling apart. So anticipating cold Atlantic Ocean water, I hopped on Reddit looking for suggestions on best wetsuits for tall, skinny men. And guess what? There's a whole rabbit hole, a wormhole you can go into ex exploring the fine details of wetsuits for tall, skinny men. Uh, what I've noticed is Distraction is like a virus. When my concentration is strong, it's like my immune system is strong and I can fight off viruses, no problem. I can kind of like fight off the distractions. But when it's weak, when I'm tired, when I'm unfocused, my immune, it's like my immune system is down. 
and so much time can go by. It's embarrassing to admit the, the dreck that I allow to pass through my brain. The other night I, I woke up, I thought, why was I dreaming about riding a horse across the Scottish Highlands last night? And I realized, oh, I watched some Monty Python skits the night before. Ugh. So mindfulness is paying attention on purpose. It's kind of combating that lack of clarity, the lack of focus, and, and cultivating that sense of, a, of attention on purpose. So to support myself to be more mindful in produ productivity, the most powerful things I do are first, I write down three things to accomplish today. I write them out by hand, the top things, and I basically just tell myself if I get these three things done, it's been a great day. I will jot down some secondary things that would be nice, but it's those top three things. And then I do the hardest one first, which gives me that sense of accomplishment and sets me up for the next one. That's that works for me. Also, to really support myself in concentration and not getting distracted, I use the Pomodoro technique, which I've talked about before. 25 minutes of exclusive focused work with a forced five minute break. I've also found that, um, not all the time, but sometimes having some kind of a soundtrack, I use dual binaural beats, which is a whole technology of of one frequency that's a little bit different than the other frequency in your ears that tends to help create more of a more of a flow state. So I, I use an app called um, oh gosh what's it called Focus at Will which has been very helpful but there are tons of dual binaural stuff out there. Finally in addition to three things I'm going to get done for the day in addition to using the Pomodoro technique when, to help me get those riverbanks for my focus and setting up a soundtrack to help me stay present. Finally, what I also focus on really comes from this line that says, don't manage your projects, manage your energy. So I'm really aware that there are times when I'm really, really into something and I'll go beyond my 25 minutes and I'll push to maybe 45 or 50 minutes I've, and I've expended too much energy and energy and then I'm I'm a little I'm sh kind of shot so I try to listen when I need to take energy breaks to move around if I'm doing 25 minute focus sessions I'll I kind of plan my tasks between the focus sessions okay at the end of this 25 minutes I'm going to go down and and uh, put something in the washing machine one of the best is a uh, jumping rope. You just jump rope for uh, three minutes, boom, your energy's back. <laughs> so mostly it comes down to one of my definitions of being more mindful in your life is self-awareness and self-diagnosis. And they're based on a couple questions. The first is what's happening right now? This is self-awareness. What's my state right now? What am I feeling right now? What's the quality of aliveness in my body? What's my emotional state? What's my mental state? That's identifying what's present. And then there's self-diagnosis. Well, what do I need right now? How can I, how does this want me to be with it? Is there anything that would help me to be more mindful in responding to the here and now? Self-awareness and self-diagnosis. And I think this is the art. You know, we can't make the flow state happen. We can't make intuition happen. We can't make mindfulness happen, but we can create the most optimal environment possible for it to occur. So in work, those moments when you're present, you're, you're concentrated, you're engaged, you're challenged, but you're also enjoying kind of this, the discovery of what's happening. When it's in balance, it's exquisite. And when it's not, it's miserable. So let me talk about mindfulness and miserable for a few moments here.
I was spending some time with a fellow who wanted to explore um, his depression. And as we got together, he told me a story. He, he was a young guy. He was in college. And he had this dream of making, uh, making it on the Olympic canoeing team. And he wanted it so bad. He gave himself to it fully, trained really, really hard. And a week before the tryouts, he told me he worked out like he never had before. He pushed himself to the edge again and again to kind of build up strength. And at the day of the trials, he was gassed. His body hadn't recovered from the workouts. And he performed poorly and he didn't make the team. And subsequently was dealing with a sense of loss and a sense of grief and the sense of recrimination. And this is really the art of engaging and recovery, conscious engagement and conscious recovery. And we so easily fall out of balance. How many times in your life have you known you could have given a little more? pushed a little harder, maybe got a second wing, engaged a little bit more fully, but you didn't. And how many times has your body told you it needed rest or nutrition or self-care and you ignored it or overrode it? And to me, this is key to mindfulness in daily life. To be aware of what feeds you, of what you love, what enlivens you, to be aware of what depletes you, to be aware of what you're avoiding, to be aware of where you're holding back, to be aware of where you are failing to listen inwardly. And the failure to have tea with your demons when your demons come to tea. A question I ask myself from time to time and I find very helpful is to do a little inventory and ask what's between me and feeling free right now? What's between me and feeling happy? And just to reflect and begin to name everything in the landscape of my life that's between me and feeling free and feeling happy. It's a, again, self-awareness and self-diagnosis. And taking the time when something comes up, rather than to ignore it or overwrite it or postpone it, when the time is right to turn toward it is just so key. I was transitioning from a project, thinking of a new project, something that I thought would be really, really great. I just couldn't get start. I couldn't get started. I couldn't, I couldn't get going. Something was holding me back. So time to have tea with my demon. The RAIN practice, R-R-A-I-N, such a beautiful structure for this. The R is to recognize or realize what's present. And I realized I'm stuck. I'm not sure if this new project is what I want or if it's the best thing to focus on. I'm confused. This is an opportunity. It sounded really good, but something's not right here. So recognizing, realizing what's here. I'm stuck. The A is to ask if if you can allow it, if you can accept that. So for me at this moment, sometimes I don't have the energy or the focus or it's just not appropriate, but yeah, let me have tea with this, which leads to the I investigation or being intimate with it. And the I happens on two levels and the primary level is somatic, exploring how those issues live in your tissues. So I could turn my attention inward and breathe. I noticed there was kind of lost, kind of stuck. There was something kind of in my chest and belly that felt really young. I was really aware that there's something inside that really wanted this project. And there was something that wasn't so sure. Well, what kind of wanted it was like felt more up here, what didn't want it was more of like a clench in my belly. And then I became more aware of this conflict. Something in me was excited, something wasn't so sure. And of course, depending which one has the microphone, that's the one that will dominate my mind. 
So I opted to look at the something that wasn't so sure. And here I could feel kind of a tightening fist in my belly and my lower abdomen. I just kind of made room for that. Another way you can explore an investigation is what you're believing. So as I sat with this tight, sort of fearful, shutdown place, I was aware of my thoughts, like yeah, I might take this on and fail miserably. I might put a lot of time into this new project and I might find out I don't really want to do it. And there's also this feeling of like, I have to figure this out. There's no one can help me. I'm alone with this. So I sat with that clench. I sat with those thoughts just to really sense how, how does this live on the inside? And then that allowed me to call on the N of this equation to, of nurturing what I find bringing in a sense of empathy, compassion, kindness. The question I find so helpful when I can find that knot or that clench is to ask, how does this want me to be with it right now? And I, I asked that question, I listened and I sensed, and I opened to it and I just sensed it just wanted to be noticed. It wanted to be seen and it wanted to be heard. There was something in here around feeling kind of scared, around feeling judged. The more I sat with it, the more I had a sense of like, this just very young place of feeling like I needed to prove myself. Since I'm, I'm never enough, I have to keep going. I have to keep proving myself in order to be deserving. I continue to sense what it's like just to be kind and to be empathic, to hold it in loving presence just to see it, to keep coming back to just being with it, with empathy. Over time, and again, part of this practice is to notice when you feel a shift, to track it. And I could feel that, that fearful place of, I've, I've got to prove myself. It started, started to disband. I started to feel like, you know, when I revisited this project, this could be fun. I started to feel some of that genuine enthusiasm, a sense of playfulness. When I take the time to address my procrastination, my resistance, my, my wanting to be distracted, applying that quality of mindfulness, wow, does that make a difference? This talk is really going by fast. I'm aware I only have a few more minutes and I'm only uh, a little more than halfway through, so maybe this will be a two-parter. Let me touch on a couple things. Back to mindfulness in daily life. A big part of everyone's day is the opportunity for mindful eating or to be aware when you're not mindfully eating. And this, again, is an area where um, I could definitely grow. <laughs> There's a whole story of a, of a teacher who's standing over his students. He's got these young boys in this monastery. And when they are doing their work, he says, when you read, read. Be one-pointed. When you read, read. When they're having their meals, he's standing over them saying, when you eat, eat, be fully present for what's here. And as the story goes, late one night, some of the, uh, the young boys were really hungry and they broke into the kitchen and there was their master eating a bowl of rice and reading the newspaper. They stood around him. They didn't have to say anything because they knew they had him completely busted. He looked up and he looked around and he said, when you eat and read, eat and read. That is my refuge when I find myself eating and reading. <laughs> so mindful eating is an opportunity. 
I'm careful what I eat, I enjoy what I eat, but I rarely sit quietly just with my meal. And so I'll just say, it's a question. How could you cultivate more mindfulness around food? So when you eat, you're, you're eating. I once led a workshop on mindful eating years ago. And, um, and I asked a question to the group. I said, you know, after this experience of really bringing yourself in communion with food, being more aware of the body, feeling the food in the body, listening to the wisdom of the body, what would you like to change? And someone raised their hand and they said, I'm so inspired by, by this day. From now on, I'm only gonna eat sitting down because for years, I, I've only eaten standing. I thought, wow, that's a, that's a new edge. I can't imagine uh, years of just only eating standing or walking. But for this person, that was the edge. I'm just gonna sit down when I eat. So you might ask yourself, how could you make meals more mindful? I was raised a Quaker. We took a moment of silence before we ate, which when I do that is a really wonderful thing. You might take a few moments just to look at your food, just to sort of take in the visuals. Another practice that some people use is to just to chew 30 times per mouthful, or simply to put your fork down between bites. Is just a, another way to kind of slow down and pay more attention. So part of mindfulness in daily life is taking time to turn toward whatever is present, to investigate resistance, to turn toward where you feel less than fully alive, and to bring yourself back again and again to being present to what's, what's fully here. What I haven't been able to talk about because of our time limitation is how I bring mindfulness to the end of the day. And there are a number of things I do to kind of, again, be aware of where the resistance is, be aware of how I can cultivate more of a flow state, and perhaps I'll, I'll get into that later. But just in closing, I'll offer the following. The Buddha famously said, finding your path is your path. Finding your Dharma is a Dharma, is your Dharma. So part of what this means is to give yourself fully to a practice and then evaluate, is a result more wholesome or less wholesome? And as you reflect on your day, how you spend your days, very important to ask yourself, what drains me? What feeds me? What habits or practices might I explore or letting go? And what habits or practices might cultivate a greater sense of presence, a greater sense of joy? So we'll take just a moment to do a short reflection. If you like, you can close your eyes. You might just take a few moments and just imagine one change you might make. What's one, ch one change you might cultivate in your day that would support you in opening more into this sense of presence, sparking more joy in your life. What might you let go or what might you cultivate? One practice I like to explore, which I don't do all the time, is the offering of merit. You might just take a moment and just sense here 
whatever whatever fruit of your mindfulness practice in this day, whatever benefit you have engendered, whatever you have let go of that no longer serves you, whatever you have cultivated that enhances your sense of radiance and aliveness, offer the merit, offer the fruit of that to yourself. Imagine your path opening with greater ease and well-being. And offer the merit, offer the fruit of that practice to those in your inner circle. May these beings effortlessly receive the fruit of your practice. And imagine that radiating out to everyone you interact with, those you are yet to meet on this path, and radiating out to all beings in all directions, including yourself. May all beings feel free from stress. May all beings feel a deepening sense of peace and joy. May all beings feel safe. When you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. Thank you so much for your time and attention. It was fun to kind of reflect on some of the mindfulness practices in your life, and I hope that you cultivate more and more of a sense of joy in your life. Happy trails. Thank you so much.